I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to Greenbelt Baptist Church. It's a joy to see you all this morning. If you are a visitor with us, we are especially grateful that you're here. Uh, we welcome you, and uh, if you received a bulletin on your way in, there's a portion at the bottom we'd love for you to tear off and toss it in the offering box. We can know that you are here and reach out to you and minister to you in any way that we can. Uh, we'd love to share with you who we are as a church and, most importantly, why we are gathered here this morning in the name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we'd love to share with you the gospel uh, of him. I want to begin our time this morning by reading from uh, Isaiah chapter 6, a famous passage, but I think an important one as we gather and as we come to worship this morning. Isaiah says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Jesus says in the Gospel of John that as Isaiah looked and beheld the glory of God in the temple, Jesus says, Isaiah actually looked at me, the incarnate Son of God, the pre-incarnate Son of God in human form. We come now this morning to worship the incarnate Son of God. We, in this Christmas season, celebrate the Advent when the Son of God became man, clothed himself in human flesh. And so we, this morning, as we gather to worship God, we gather in the name of Jesus Christ, and we come and we worship God through and by Jesus, and, and we do exactly what Isaiah was doing. We look, and as we hear, and as we sing, and as we hear from God's word this morning, we worship our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that he's done for us. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer together. Our great Heavenly Father, it is with joy and humility this morning that we come and we gather in your name. Father, we thank you that you allow us into your presence, into your very presence this morning through the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that it is by him and through him that we are able to worship you. Father, in and of ourselves, we, we are nothing and we have nothing to offer because you are holy and you are infinite and you are perfect and we are not. And yet this morning, it is by your son and his righteousness and his shed blood for us that we come and we worship and we are declared right before you. Father, we ask this morning that as we come and as we gather in your name and as we sing your praises and as we hear from your word, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that we would come rightly before you, and Father, we would be changed this morning, conformed and molded into the image of our Savior. Lord, we ask that you would do this for us because we cannot do it ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Angels from the Realms of Glory, from the hymn. Yeah. 
hymn 192, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Singing, as we just did, upon the angels, the herald angels singing. Uh, listen to um, what Schaefer, Francis Schaefer says, reflecting here on the shepherd's experience in the Gospel of Luke. Let us consider how seeing and hearing the angels would have affected those first shepherds, and especially their praying. While the reality of all this was upon the shepherds, I think prayer would have been an exceedingly simple experience. Communication with God would have become easy for them because they had seen the supernatural. It had not been miles above their heads, as it were, for if the shepherds heard the angels, why shouldn't God now hear the shepherds? If on the night after all this had occurred, a shepherd were sitting in the same place where just 24 hours before he had seen the heavens opened. And if he had had a child who was ill, perhaps it inconceivable, even if he had known nothing previously about prayer, oh, now would he not have gone and shouted up to heaven, praying for his child? We can envision him sitting there without knowing much about the realities or theology of prayer, not knowing that he could just pray in his heart and thinking, well, I could hear those angels. Surely God can hear me. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now as needy, needy people. And we acknowledge that oftentimes we come to prayer with an unbelieving heart, thinking that maybe we're just speaking words into the ether. Well, Lord, we come now confessing, acknowledging, and admitting that you are a God who hears. We come to you now as a group of people in need of you hearing. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers. We're weak. We are full of stumbling and bumbling about. And Lord, we are in need of your attuned ear to our pleas. We come to you now praying specifically for your attuned ear to our confession of sin. How often, Lord, how often, Lord, do we give our attention to the things that are here and now, to the visible pizzazz of Netflix and social media, to the immediate demands of family, to the ever-groaning attention demanded by politics and our 24-hour media. And Lord, we've neglected to come to you in prayer. Forgive us. Forgive us. We're needy, and yet we act as if we can do all things ourselves. We are weak, and yet we act as if we do not need you. So, Lord, as we pray to you now, we ask that you would hear this prayer. And, Lord, in this prayer, that you would be pleased to hear our request and for forgiveness. Forgive us for our prayerlessness. And, Lord, in this prayer, we pray that you would stir us up to prayerfulness. Father, we go into this Christmas season, many of us on break, children home from school, visiting family or having family visit with us. Lord, would we not be distracted by that ever-present buzz and bumble of everything going on? And Lord, would you move us to give the best of our day to private prayer? Lord, that we would find time to steal away to our closet. And Lord, in that moment, believe, help us to believe that you hear and that you listen and that you delight in the weak, stuttering prayers of your servant. Lord, as we come now to partake of the Lord's Supper, Father, would we do so believingly knowing that you have forgiven us for our wandering hearts, for our prayerlessness, and knowing that in taking this supper, you are pleased to give us grace. And in this supper, to give us assurance that we are forgiven, and in this supper, to give us a means of grace wherein we are made more like our Savior, Jesus. As we, as we behold him, eat his flesh and drink his blood. Lord, not in the elements themselves, but by faith. Lord, make us one with him. We know that even now he is an interceding high priest ever praying before you. Lord, would we become more prayerful as our prayerful Savior is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to the Lord's table. Uh, not thinking that the bread is the actual body of our Savior and the, and the cup is his actual blood, but they are signs that we see, and by faith and by the power of Holy, his Holy Spirit, we are drawn to heaven and therein actually become partakers of the body and blood of our Savior. John Knox, in his Lord's Supper service, reminded his church, and this is a good reminder for us, that we confess that this is a holy action commanded us by God the Father. This is something Christians 
are not given an option to do, but ought to do, and it is good for our faith. He reminds us that in setting forth the bread and the wine to eat and to drink, God confirms and seals up for us his promise and communion, but that by partaking in this, we're reminded that we are partakers of Christ and in a holy communion with him in heaven. He reminds us that the Lord Jesus, in giving us this Lord's Supper, gathers us together. This is our communion together as one body. And so as we eat and drink and and remember our union with Christ, we're also reminded of our union with one another. We are brothers and sisters. We are together as one body. And finally, we're reminded that by this sacrament, the Lord calls us to a remembrance of his death and passion. And that ought to stir up our hearts to gratitude. Christ has given himself for our sins. What was done on the cross is done and is finished. His body has been broken and his blood has been shed for our sins. And if you are a believer in him, praise God, this feast is a celebratory feast because it reminds us that we are forgiven forever in Jesus Christ. If that describes you, a forgiven believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to partake with us. Whether you're a member of our church or if you're a member of another church, if you have confessed your sins and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and uh, you believe in the gospel, we invite you to partake together in the Lord's Supper. I'd like to invite the deacons up now who will distribute. As they do, uh, you may take individually of the bread Uh, And then hold on to that second cup, no, uh, that first cup, uh, which will be the juice. Hold on to that, and we'll partake of that together, uh, commemorating our oneness together as a body. Let me pray before we do. Our omnipotent and everlasting God, whom all creatures know and confess to be governor and king and Lord, but we as your creatures created anew, in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. O Lord, as we come now before your table, give us a fear, an adoration, a love, and a praise for your godly majesty. And Lord, in this supper, draw us to celebrate together the goodness of who Jesus Christ is for us, our King, our Savior, our atoning sacrifice. And Lord, as we partake in thanksgiving, Lord, may this stir us up to grace. May this stir us up to assurance of faith. And may this stir us up to greater Christ-likeness, we pray. Amen.
Let us partake together of the cup, which is the new covenant in Christ's blood. Amen. Let's stand together and sing from the songbook number 68, O God Beyond All Praising. reading this morning is from the book of John in chapter 1. You can turn there with me if you'd like. John 1, 1 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you again this morning for the opportunity to gather together as your people, to gather to knit together to the, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the light of this world, who is the one and true Savior, Son of the Holy God. Father, we thank you this morning that you have given us your gospel that you allowed us by your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our ears to see the true light of the world coming, that you have allowed us, Father, to receive your Son, the only reconciliation that there is from our sin to a righteous and holy God. Father, we pray this morning that you would continue to allow us to preach this truth and gospel. And Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, the work that we do here at Greenbelt Baptist Church to evangelize and be a light to this community, Father, would just be fruitful. Father, we know that our work alone means nothing and that we do nothing on our own, not by the will of our flesh or our own will, Father, but by God's will, may this thing happen. So, Father, we pray by your Holy Spirit and that it be the will of God that many here in Greenbelt come to hear the gospel and that their hearts would be softened and that their eyes would be opened to the truth of the word of God. Father, we know, again, that our work is not the thing that brings people to salvation, but Father, we ask that you allow us to be faithful servants, that we don't just keep our mouths shut, but with love and truth and gentleness, we preach your gospel. It is the only power given to men of the salvation of God. Father, we pray this also for our friends at Trinity Community Church in Bowie and for Pastor Chris Spana, who preaches there this morning to his congregation. Father, we we pray that you allow them also to be a light there in their community of the gospel. And Father, that you make it known in their hearts that it is not our own doing, but the will of God who has brought this light into the world and gives salvation and gives reconciliation to mankind. Father, I pray for Trinity Community that they would be a light in Bowie and preach the gospel, and it would go out there, and many in Bowie would come to saving faith. We also pray there in Bowie for our friends at Grace, uh, Grace Baptist Church, and Pastor Mark Tanius, the same, Father. We pray that they would know that their faithful service is required of them to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it is not our work, but the will of God. So, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work in our communities and that our churches would be faithful servants to you. Father, we pray this morning for our sister Marianne Baker, who suffered a fall and injury. Father, we praise you for the subsequent surgery that went well. We thank you for the doctors and their wisdom. Father, we just ask that you be with her in recovery, and that she would heal quickly, and we would be able to see her again soon. Father, we pray that you would sustain and strengthen her spirit, strengthen her faith in you. And Father, I pray for our church that we would be loving and kind and serving her, reaching out, praying for her and her family, and that you would return us, return her to us soon. Father, we pray this morning for the Southern Baptist Convention, who we partner with to support missionaries around the world. Father, we pray this morning for all the missionaries who are supported and sent out by the Southern Baptists. Father, we pray that you would 
sustain your gospel as what they preach to the world. Father, we pray that you would keep them from straying away from the word of God and going after all kinds of other ideology of man that brings salvation, but Father, they would preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Father, we pray that there would be much fruit that comes from the hard work of these missionaries that have left their families and their friends to go out and grow and serve the kingdom of God. And Father, we pray that your spirit would be with them and that you would sustain them and strengthen them, keep them safe. But Father, most of all, allow them to preach your gospel boldly to the world, to the tribes and to the nations that have not heard your word, Father, and that your Holy Spirit would go out before them and open those ears and eyes and minds as well. Father, we pray this morning for Governor Hogan as he seeks to lead our state. Father, we pray that you would give him wisdom. Father, we pray that he would be successful. Father, I also pray that he would know that this responsibility that has been given to him to lead this state comes from you. Father, you are sovereign over all things, and you raise up kings and governors, and you set them in their place, and you expect them to do your will and to execute justice in the land. Father, I pray that Governor Hogan would have this on his mind and his heart. Father, I pray for his salvation this morning, that if he does not know you, Father, that your spirit would go to him, and he would hear your word and hear of your son, Jesus Christ, and he would believe and be saved. Father, we pray also for him with wisdom as he continues to lead our state through the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, that he would seek to keep uh, safe the people of Maryland, but also to protect them from tyranny and to protect them uh, from, from hate and injustice and violence. Father, we pray for Governor Hogan this morning again, and we ask that you watch over him and our entire state government. Father, we pray this morning for our hearts and our minds as we prepare to hear the word preached from Pastor Unthank. Father, allow us to hear this morning and to put away all our preconceived notions of your word and hear from your scripture. Allow it to be confirmed in our heart by your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that Steve's words this morning will be your words and that we'll be edified this morning and sanctified by your word. And that as a body, we would come, Father, to love the word of God, and to rely on it for life and truth. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand once again and sing from the hymnal number 432, Speak, O Lord. Ah, uh-huh. 
Again, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 34. Jeremiah 34. We will look this morning at chapters 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. Let me begin by praying. Our Father, we ask for your help. Your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and Lord, we need its piercing truth to penetrate into the depths of our dark and at times hardened hearts. Lord, bring us the grace, the sovereign, miraculous, divine grace to do what we cannot do by ourselves, to hear Believe and submit to your word so that we might believe, submit, and love you, our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is almost Christmas. So read with me the first nine words which open up for us chapter 34. Just the first nine words. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Amen. In six days, we will celebrate Christmas, which properly speaking is a celebration of the incarnation of the Son of God. The historical reality that God, who is eternal and infinite Father, Son, and Spirit, that the Father sent His infinite Son to take on finite flesh, and through the Virgin Mary was born to us the God-man, Jesus Christ. That is Christmas. I was reading earlier this week the early church father Athanasius, and was struck by Athanasius's meditation on the Incarnation, In light of what we just read in Jeremiah 34, verse 1, those first nine words, Athanasius says this, We know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is what John tells us in John 1, verse 14. That was read earlier for us by Phil. Athanasius continues, There is a falsehood, a heresy, in thinking that just as in the Old Testament times when the word of God used to come into the prophets, so likewise now in Christ, the word of God, the Son of God, was merely dwelling in a man, sanctifying some particular man and showing forth the divine nature in that man, just as he did in those other Old Testament prophets. That, says Athanasius, is a heresy. That is not what the Apostle John tells us. If this were so, and the Word only appeared in a man, this would be nothing new or startling. Those who saw him wouldn't have cried out. 
Where does he come from? As they do in John 8, 14. They wouldn't have cried out as the Pharisees do in John 10, 33. Why do you, being a man, make yourself God? After all, the Pharisees knew well enough the idea of the word merely dwelling in a man. The Old Testament is replete with passages of Scripture that say, and the word of the Lord came to this prophet or that prophet. No. What does the New Testament tell us? But now the word of God, by whom all things came into existence, lowered himself to become a child of humanity, humbling himself to take a servant's shape. For as John says in John 1.14, the word became flesh. The word who became flesh in John's gospel is the same word who came to Jeremiah in this book, Jeremiah. Now, it's the end of Athanasius' quote. Arguably, the word of God is the main character in the entire book of Jeremiah. We said that at the beginning of our study in the introduction. I, I, I just want to repeat that. I think the main character is the word of God. The word has been the driving engine behind every major event in this book. It's the word that comes to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is then faithful to declare that word, which he's given the grace to do so by the promise of the word, by the promise of God. The words, plural, that Jeremiah preaches is God's word, singular, so that very often... God's word is being spoken through Jeremiah's words. And the whole book of Jeremiah is mapping out how that word is either heard and obeyed or rejected and disobeyed. Which is fascinating because God's word is ever living and ever active. Which means that the word Jeremiah proclaimed in his own day was written down, preserved, and is now being proclaimed in our day. The word of God is still confronting people today. As we read through and preach Jeremiah, you're being confronted with that very same living and active word. We're participants in an ongoing story. And you, right here, right now, you could either hear and obey this word, or you can reject and disobey. Which is the same thing as saying... You can either believe in Jesus, or you can reject and disbelieve Jesus. Ever since Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and God spoke his word to them, a word which said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did he speak that word to them? Because your sole duty, Adam, is to trust my word, says God. I declare what is good and what is not good. And I want you to live your life trusting me and trusting my word. And ever since that moment, the evil one has been working to lead people away from trusting in God's word. He wants to get people to trust in their own knowledge, their own internal words and conversations in their own mind, their own autonomous determination of what they think is good or what they think is bad. But God so loved this fallen and sinful world that he did something incredible. He sent his son, who is the word. He sent him to become a man, and as a man, he was both the son of God and the son of Adam. He was both the word of God and a hearer of God's word. And as a man, he always obeyed. He always listened to his father. He always obeyed his father. And he loved his father. And because he did that, entirely perfectly, he did not deserve to die. But he did die. He died to take our punishment. He died to make a sacrificial atonement for all of us so that all of us, disobedient, rebellious people who really hate God's word, all of us can be forgiven, and we can be ransomed from slavery. 
We no longer need to be enslaved to our own desires, to our own sinful wants, listening to our own words. Or we can be freed, finally freed, to listen to God and to obey His Word. There's freedom in living life under God's Word. There's life in listening to and obeying God's Word. Children, if you look in your bulletin, you will notice that there is no question for you. That was by mistake. There were questions, but I realized I sent those, texts, uh, those questions to my wife and not to the secretary. So they weren't printed in your bulletin. But I'll still ask the first question. The first question was this. What is the Word of God? What is the Word of God? Here's our answer this morning. Four things, kids, you can write down for what is the Word of God. Are you ready? God's Word is our guidance. Our guidance. Mom and Dad will help you spell that. Our light. Our light, our freedom, our freedom, and our life. God's word is our guidance, our light, our freedom, and our life. In this morning's text, we are going to see those themes emerge. In fact, I think we're going to see three things about God's word, which were not only true in Jeremiah's day, but are also just as true for us today. If you remember, Jeremiah, uh, I mean Judah, the, the nation of Judah, has been brought to the brink of disaster because of their own rejection of God's word, a reality which God himself promised would happen if they continue in disbelief. Now, now think about that. If you ask the average guy on the street in Judah, why is Judah in such a bad place? Go up to him with a microphone. I think the average guy in Judah would have given these kinds of answers. Our leaders are not making smart political decisions. Or, we're too soft on foreign affairs. Babylon has risen in military strength and we've weakened our agreement with Egypt. We, we, we need to spend more on our military defenses. Or, or perhaps you would have heard this critique that Judah was not keeping up with the times, that there were just too many people sticking to the older ways of doing things, and, 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 and we're really hampering Judah's progressive growth. We need to keep up with the way of the world and how other nations are acting these days. But if you ask the preacher Jeremiah, that weird fundamentalist guy who goes around preaching these sermons that no one wants to listen to, here's what I think... He has said, chapter after chapter in Jeremiah, the real problem is unbelief. An unbelief in God's word, which is the same thing as an unbelief in God. And so what we get now recorded for us in chapters 34 through 39 are three things about God's word which teach us that we can't treat God's word in any way we please and get away with it. That's the major point of this section. Just to show you the literary genius of Jeremiah, I want you to, to see something in how he's set this up. Remember, for Jeremiah, just like the rest of the Old Testament, the big battle, the big tension within God's people is between trusting in what you see versus in trusting in what you hear. Unbelievers trust in what they see over and against and what they hear in God's word, whereas believers trust in God's word over and, what, over and against what they see with their eyes. We're introduced, reintroduced to King Zedekiah here in chapter 34, who was certainly tempted to fear what he sees. The massive Babylonian army marching his way. The closer they get, you could probably hear miles off the stomping of thousands and thousands of Babylonians with their spears against their shields coming closer. Zedekiah sees that and fears that rather than fears God and his word. 
Look what the text says, chapter 34, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the peoples. I mean, you, you can't get more expansive and bigger than that. We're fighting against Jerusalem and all of its cities. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, thus says the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the land of the king of Babylon, and you shall burn it with fire. You shall not escape from his hand, but you shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. You, notice this verse, you shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye and speak with him face to face, and you shall go to Babylon Yet, hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you. You shall not die by the sword. You shall die in peace. And the spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you. So people shall burn spices for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have spoken the word, declares the Lord. Do you see the themes developing here? The language of seeing versus Hearing, and specifically hearing God's word. He's tempted in what he sees with these massive armies. There's a promise given through the word. You will see the king of Babylon face to face. Trust me in what I'm saying to you. Yet hear the word of the Lord, verse 4. Now jump to the end of our section this morning. Look at chapter 39. Spoiler alert. King Zedekiah wasn't faithful. He didn't trust God's word, but rather trusted in what he saw. Now read with me Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 7. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate, Nergal Sar is heir of Samgar, Nebu Sar Sahim of Rab Saris, Nergar Sar is heir of Rab Mag, with all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled, going out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls, and they went toward the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes. There's that word again. And the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. Verse 7. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. What a reversal, and yet the theme is the same. You'll see him eye to eye, hear the word of the Lord. He didn't hear the word of the Lord, and so he takes out his eyes. Jeremiah couldn't be more clear, could he? Trusting in what you see versus trusting in what you hear, specifically hearing God's word. If you do that, that will blind you and destroy you. Fearing what we can see versus having a godly fear, a fear of God who we can't see, and yet he has spoken to us. He's given us his word. That's the main battle of this text, and dear friends, might I say that that's the main battle of our lives, of every church and of every individual Christian. Do we live our lives and make our decisions based primarily and preeminently upon what we see and fear out there? Or despite what we see and fear out there, do we give the best of our heart and our attention to God's word and say, yes, Lord, you have spoken. Friends, that's our battle. So what are the three things we see from this passage concerning God's word? It's a long text, but we won't spend too much time exploring every detail. First, first we see God's word dishonored. We see God's word dishonored. And we see this specifically in verses 34, 35, and 36. Three scenes, but they all aim at the same truth. God desires faithfulness to his word, but all his people, 
at least in these chapters, have shown dishonor to his word. Chapter 34, verses 8 through 16, we, we, we basically see this, this theme of broken promises. King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people of Judah, and, and this was a covenant in keeping with God's word. What was it? That all the slaves within Judah would be set free. Now, this was specifically commanded by God in Deuteronomy. At the end of every seven years, slavery was to be done away with, and those people who served you as slaves would be set free and would, would be given land and care. And so perhaps there was a bit of a, a, of a revival going on as Josiah had recovered that Deuteronomic text. And Zedekiah had read it, and, and perhaps people lower in the, in the echelons of Judah had said, hey, we've read the text too. Seven years is coming up. Zedekiah, what are you going to do? So Zedekiah makes a covenant. Look at verse 8. A covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and free, he, female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obey all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave. Perhaps they were afraid more of a revolt. And so the higher up said, yeah, sure, we'll do it. But what happened? Well, they didn't go through with it, did they? No, they went back. They turned around, verse 11, and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subject to slaves again. Broken promises, a broken covenant. God's word said set them free. They said, yes, we'll do that. And then when the time came, they didn't. Here is nothing but the Hebrew people, the people of Judah, dishonoring God's word. What does verse 17 say? It says, you did not obey me. You have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, even one to his brother and to his neighbor. So behold, I will proclaim to you liberty to the sword. Not from the sword, to the sword. Liberty to pestilence and to famine, declares the Lord. Here's a scene where we just see the utter rejection of God's word by God's people. Notice the connection to just, just a quick, this is a quick caveat. You love God by honoring and obeying his word, and his word said to set people free. And in so doing, you would love your neighbor as yourself. Notice how in not honoring and obeying God, that expressed itself in not loving their neighbors and setting the people free. That connection is always there. That connection is always there. Secondly, in chapter 35, we see a kind of foil scene. There's this, this odd group of people called the um, uh, Rechabites. Look at chapter 35, verses 1 and 2. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers. Then offer them wine to drink. Why would God say do that? Well, because if you read through this, the Rechabites were a people who had made a promise with their forefathers that they would not drink wine. They were a kind of Old Testament teetotaler, and they said, we won't do that. In fact, we won't drink wine, we won't live in houses, and we won't plant gardens. We'll be a kind of uh, roving people, a shepherding people who, who move about the land. It's an interesting foil because just previously, remember God said to Judah, while you're in Babylon, I want you to plant houses, plant gardens. Drink and eat the fruit of your gardens. Get married. Here's a different kind of people. And yet they're set up here as a foil over and against Judah precisely because as they come to Jer uh, Jeremiah and he offers them wine, they say, no, we won't do it. They stick to their promise. They are not like Judah because they're promise keepers. They're covenant keepers. 
they've kept their promise. And so in verses 12 through 17, God through Jeremiah sets them up as an example. Look at these people. Look how even in the midst of Babylon coming to wipe them out, they still stick to their promises. They are so unlike my people, Judah. And so what God promises is that even in light of them as a mirror, as a foil to Judah, he will punish Judah even more. And he goes on to bless these Rechabites. Chapter 36, we perhaps get the clearest picture of God's word dishonored. In verses 1 through 19, we see a scene where the word of God is preached. Jeremiah gets a word from the Lord. He calls his secretary to himself, a young Baruch, in verse 4, and and Baruch writes down word for word everything that God is telling Jeremiah. And then Jeremiah tells Baruch to go and, 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 and to preach this word. It's very much a, a picture of what we do every Sunday morning. God spoke to the apostles. The apostles wrote down their word. And then the apostles went to different men, called them elders, and said, go preach that word. And we're doing that to this day. And Baruch did that. He preached faithfully what Jeremiah had written down. And what's interesting is that as he preached, it seems that it was believed. Look at verse 16, chapter 36, verse 16. Verse 15, they said to him, sit down, read it. So Baruch read it to them. And when they heard all the words, they turned to one another in fear. That's a good sign. And they said to Baruch, well, we must report all these words to the king. Then they asked Baruch, tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Baruch answered them, he dictated all these words to me. In other words, thus saith the Lord. While well, I wrote them with ink on the scroll, then the official said to Baruch, go, hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. They go to the court, and they say to the king, king, you've got to hear these words. We've just heard the word of the Lord, and, and Baruch delivered them. And our hearts were stirred to fear what these might mean for us. Hear these words. And perhaps the saddest scene in Old Testament history in relationship to how people interact with God's word plays out. They go and the king invites Baruch. Verse 27 the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation. But the picture is an ugly one. As Baruch reads and unwinds the scroll, the king is at the other end of the scroll, picking up what he had just read and cutting it off and throwing it into the fire. And Baruch is still there reading, and the king is still there cutting it off and throwing it to the fire. So that at the end of the reading and preaching of that word, there's nothing left physical. This is perhaps the high water mark of dishonor and rejection of God's word. You can imagine Baruch saying, did you hear the word that I just read to you? And the king saying, what word? I don't see anything. What just happened? Go away, Baruch. I want you to notice, though, even if it's an ever so brief note, but we see God's word being preserved. At the end of chapter 36, Baruch goes back to Jeremiah, <laughs> and God speaks to Jeremiah the exact same thing that the king just burned up. In fact, he gives a little bit extra detail, probably against the king himself. Uh, just a wonderful glimpse of God preserving his word. God preserving his word. Well, there's God's word dishonored. The second thing we see is God's word rejected. Chapters 37 and 38 show us more of, of God's word being rejected. Chapter 37, look at verses 1 and 2. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had made king in the land of Judah, resigned instead of Paniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listen to the words of the Lord that he spoke through Jeremiah, the prophet. Here, it's an ongoing theme of 
them not only dishonoring God, but rejecting, ongoing rejection of God's word. And specifically, in verses 1 through 6, it seems to be a kind of political fear. It's a fear that what Jeremiah is preaching means sure doom, and the way in which they're interpreting it is, huh, Jeremiah certainly must be in the pocket of Babylon. Is he, is he a spy here giving us fake news and false information in order to, to make us give ourselves up to Babylon? No, Jeremiah, we need to stay and fight. We need to align ourselves with Egypt. Jeremiah kept saying, no, give yourselves into Babylon. And if you so do, God will protect you. They don't like that. They don't like that at all. And so, led out of political fear, they reject God. And they reject Jeremiah, the messenger of God's word. I think it's very fascinating. In verse 6 and following, they go and arrest him. And, 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 and what they do is they lower him. Look at, look at chapter 37, verse 6. Um, I'm sorry, verse, uh, chapter uh, 38, verse 6. They took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which is in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Rather than throwing him into jail, they lower him down into this empty, sinking cistern. Old Testament readers of this text constantly describe this as Jeremiah's entrance into Sheol. It's a picture of him entering into death. And interestingly, just as in chapter 36 where God preserved his word, well, what does God do now with his messenger of his word? He preserves him. Uh, through an Ethiopian, uh, uh, he hears that Jeremiah has been lowered down. And so this Ethiopian goes to the king and says, you can't do this. You've got to lift up this man of God. And the king says, okay, go get him. And so he gets about three men or so, and, and they, they, they throw ropes down, and, and they pull Jeremiah back up. You can see him covered in mud almost as he was sinking down into his death. I think it's very fascinating. In chapter 36, the king refuses to listen to God's word and tries to destroy the message. Chapter 37 and 38, the king refuses to listen to the message and tries to destroy the messenger. In chapter 36, God is so good at preserving his message. And in chapters 37 and 38, he's excellent at preserving his messenger. The other battle here, not just between trusting in what you see and versus what you hear, but the other battle here, is unbelievers working things for evil and out of that, God using it for good. God using it for good. The last thing we, we see is God's word fulfilled and that comes finally in chapter 39. Chapter 39 brings us to the fall of Jerusalem and we read the first part already where King Zedekiah is taken away and blinded. Verse 8, the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile the Babylon, into Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted him and the people who remained. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. What a fascinating reversal, where the very king of Judah himself, who was meant to be God's representative to the people, continually enslaves them, and now the foreign unbeliever gives land and freedom to those who were formerly enslaved. Interesting, interesting things going on. There's a couple of things I want us to see as we come to a close here. First, let's not miss the point that God is amazingly long-suffering throughout this whole ordeal. We're up to chapter 39, and now finally Judah and Jerusalem have been thrown over by unbelieving Babylon. In other words, God is patient. He's entirely slow to anger. 
Now, be clear, to be clear here, the predominant theme of this book is God's wrath. And God's wrath will not be turned aside. But remember, Judah's sins have been building up here for centuries. Chapter after chapter. They reject God's word. And chapter after chapter, God sends Jeremiah to say, repent. Or won't you repent? Won't you repent? God has been absolutely patient throughout this whole ordeal. And that theme is still true today. There are many here, perhaps, who week after week hear God's word, and they know what God's word says about a particular aspect of their lives, perhaps a particular sin that only you know and only God knows. And week after week, God says, repent, repent of that sin. And week after week, you coddle it, you keep it hidden. You say, no, no, I can manage. This sin and I have a good relationship. These chapters, this section reminds us that there's a day when that penny will drop. But until that day comes, oh, dear friend, will you not repent? Will you not give up that idol, that sin which king clings so closely, and turn to the God who offers you even now full forgiveness, full redemption, and full freedom from that sin? Romans 2 tells us that God is forbearing. And Paul says in Romans 2, it's because of that that God has not yet brought about the end. We do realize, don't we, that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven? God is patient. Hell is real. Judgment is coming. But our God has not thrown you into the fire yet. The second thing I want us to see is that judgment is not the last word. And there's where we'll end this morning. Jeremiah, I think Jeremiah points us in a wonderful way to the greater weeping prophet, Jesus Christ. We've seen already how Jeremiah was lowered into Sheol, as it were, and then miraculously, by God's grace, lifted out. But I think Jeremiah points to Christ in an even better way. We've seen these glimpses of hope throughout the book, where God has said, I'm going to bring you back from exile. And, and, and there, there, there are these post-exilic prophets too, these post-exilic books like Ezra and Nehemiah, books like Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi that talk about what happens to the Lord's people when they actually do return. There are glimpses of hope, promises of ultimate restoration, not final judgment. There are even promises of a time when God's people will be made up of more than Jews from the south and Israelites from the north. And he'll bring in Babylonians and other people as well. There are promises to the nations throughout this book that we've seen. Above all, as we saw last week, Keith wonderfully pointed this out, there's a promise of a new covenant in which people's sins are genuinely forgiven. And God's law is, is no longer just written on books or scrolls that can be burned. No, but God's law will be written on the hearts of his people. And when that happens, there's a transformation. That word we hear, and it's written on our hearts, and we become new creatures where we can't help but obey. And that finally will be consummated when Christ comes at the end of the age. But already, for us, it's happening now. We've heard God's word, and if you believed in Christ, you are a new creature with his law written upon your heart. But in some ways, Jeremiah himself as a man Still points ahead. Think about this. Here's someone who faithfully gives God's word in hard times. And he's always disbelieved. And he suffers. He's a weeping prophet. How analogous this is to Christ. Who gives God's word. Is always disbelieved by his own people. And who suffers because of the truth of what he proclaims. Jeremiah points to Christ, and Christ, like Jeremiah before him, faithfully gives the word of the Lord and is precisely disbelieved because he's speaking the truth. But there's one crucial difference. In Jeremiah, the guilty, the Zedekiahs, the Malchijahs, 
the other prophets, the false prophets in the king's court, the false priests. The guilty in Jeremiah's day are finally put to death under Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah, because he's ultimately transported to Egypt at the end of chapter 39, Jeremiah survives. In some sense, Jeremiah, by the end of this book, is vindicated. Huh, I guess that old fundamentalist preacher was right. Which is precisely why we still have this in our Bible, and we read it today. But with Jesus, the innocent one, the innocent one is the one who's put to death. Not Pilate, not Herod, not the leaders of the Jews. It's the innocent one who's put to death precisely so that he can vindicate others. Precisely so that he can justify us who did not listen to him in the first place. Which reminds us in the most powerful way that Christ's death is absolutely unique and that Christ's sacrificial death upon the cross, well, that's our salvation. There's our prophet. He's our true priest. He's the true king. And he's a savior in whom we can have full confidence that he will lead us to glory, escaping this Babylon here to a new and heavenly Jerusalem where we will enjoy him forevermore. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Our great heavenly Father, your word is truth. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Your word is living and it is active and it pierces to our very hearts and souls. And yet, Father, too often we disregard it. We disobey it. We take it lightly. We dishonor it. We listen to the voices of our culture of others who may say they have our best interests at heart, of politicians, of so many others. And yet, Father, we do not listen to your word. Would you forgive us for this? Father, would you by your spirit Take your word and plant it deep within us. Cause us to love it and to meditate upon your word day and night. Father, so that we may be conformed more and more by it into the image of our Savior, who is the word incarnate. Father, we need your help this morning. We cannot do this on our own. Given to ourselves, Lord, we would find distraction after distraction after distraction. Father, filling our minds with everything else. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is the life that we need. Father, we thank you that it illumines our path, that it is trustworthy in all things. Lord, would you give us the, the courage and the strength to listen to and obey your word over and against a culture that says the exact opposite? Lord, would you help us to be like the prophet Jeremiah, and, and ultimately to be like your son who proclaim your word to a lost and dying world, no matter what they may think of us. Father, Christ said that uh, if they rejected him and they put him to death, they would do the same to us, his disciples. Father, would you give us the strength to obey the, his commands? to take your word to the nations. Lord, we thank you for all the promises that your word contains. Promises of life, pro promises that you will never leave us nor forsake us. 
Father, promises that you will give us the wisdom necessary to navigate life in this world. Lord, we need not trust ourselves because you have given us everything we need for life and godliness in your word, both written and incarnate in your son. We thank you, and it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we do pray this morning. We're going to switch it up, as we do occasionally, and sing hymn 456, How Firm a Foundation. It's not going to be on the screen, so you will need your hymnal. I'll give you a minute to do that. But hymn 456, How Firm a Foundation. Notice, we just heard about the word. and uh, But notice also verse 4, The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. I was reminded of this as Steve was preaching this morning, I think appropriate song. So we'll sing hymn 456. announcements this morning. Uh, still no Sunday evening service uh, tonight, not until uh, the second week of January. So tonight uh, and next week, um, I think our, the next one will be January 9th is when we'll resume. January 9th is when we'll resume evening service. Also, there's no Sunday school this coming Sunday. There is church. Uh, but uh, no Sunday school. We're taking a break for all Sunday schools across the board for adults and children, um, but we will pick back up uh, the following week in the new year. Um, there is no Bible study this Wednesday. 
There's no Bible study this Wednesday, though we will pick that back up uh, in the new year as well. So what are we doing this coming week? Well, we have a Christmas Eve candlelight service, December 24th, right here. Uh, That's at uh, 7 p.m., and you are invited back for a time of uh, singing and praying. Uh, We will uh, join together with Aletheia Church, as we do every year, and um, hear sermons, short sermons from both Rob Stevens uh, and a short meditation from myself, and uh, sing carols and hymns uh, in, in wondrous praise to the miracle of the Incarnation. So you're invited back December 24th, 7 p.m. right here. And then, yes, we will have um, church on uh, the 26th, on the 26th. Uh, Last thing, um, I want to give a big thank you to all those who volunteered, who helped organize and volunteer for our Christmas party yesterday. My kids were there, and they loved it. Uh, It seemed to be an excellent event. Claudia, do you want to come up and say anything about that? Um, no. I'll just say that um, it was. It was a lot of fun. We were maybe a little smaller in number than I had prayed for, but, you know, the Spirit of God was there and alive, and it was such a joyful time. And the adult and every child, really, and they had a, a wonderful time of fellowship and uh, just praising God and Jesus, the Savior, who's born. So Amen. thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all of you who came out. Jesus promises that those who are faithful in the little and small things will be given more responsibility in the greater things. And I can say as one watching in, uh, you all were very faithful, and everything was done incredibly well. And so I'm looking forward to the way in uh, which the Lord will grow this throughout the years. We'll stand this morning, please, for this morning's benediction. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the word, to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings, the word has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about our obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.